What's the hard stop time? Uh, 6.15. And so we should be getting into questions by six, no later than six, right? Correct. Thanks everyone for joining. We'll get started in just a second. Okay, it looks like people are still joining. We're gonna give it about a minute and then we'll get started with our panel. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for joining. I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off to Liz, our president, to get us started. All right, there we go. Thank you so much, Nelly. It's really great to be here with all of you. I appreciate everyone coming tonight. We know you have many options for your time. I'm so delighted to welcome you to our official Presidio International Women's Day panel, celebrating women in sustainability and social justice. This is a global celebration day dedicated to uplifting women and also a vital call to action for accelerating gender equality, which we believe is an essential step to building a sustainable future, which of course is what Presidio is all about. Um, there's no better way than I can think of to celebrate this important day than to be joined by three of our alumni and one of our amazing faculty who will moderate it. Um, these are all women who are making a significant impact in their respective fields, and we think you will learn a lot from each of their stories. Uh, before we do that, though, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to Presidio Graduate School for those of you who may be a little less familiar with us. Presidio's mission is to educate change makers to build a flourishing future for all, which is a mission we take very seriously. It is at the core of everything we do, and it is at the core of why we were founded 20 years ago this year. Uh, when our founders created Presidio Graduate School, they believed that a new kind of business school and graduate school education was needed to transform the way leaders lead through the really tough challenges that we face in society today. Um, and ever since that time, 20 years ago, we've worked so hard to educate 2000 alumni change makers who are out there boldly making a difference every day in their companies and their organizations and in the public sector and beyond. For those in the audience who might be thinking of whether graduate school should be in your future, uh, the short answer is yes. And we offer a number of different programs here that focus on creating a more equitable, sustainable future at the core of our mission. Um, but you might be wondering, well, how do you do that? It sounds big, that sounds complicated. Um, and it is, but here at Presidio, we have several ways that we equip our graduates to change the world. Um, first is by giving really concrete and helpful tools and areas of knowledge that will enable our graduates to create meaningful change. Um, and that's true in all of our classes. Um, every single class you take, you will learn some practical ways that you can make a difference, as well as some inspiring ways that will change your outlook on life. Um, and this is true whether you're going into a corporate ESG role or nonprofit leadership or starting your own social entrepreneurial company or organization or more. Um, another factor you should know about Presidio is that our students are not just learning and kind of waiting till they leave to be able to build their 
real world experience, but in their classes, they are actually building their tangible experience in ways um, that is complementing their learning as well as adding elements to their resume and LinkedIn profiles. Um, that happens in our experiential learning courses, especially as well as a number of our courses that use project-based learning at the core, um, including Carrie's course, which you'll hear about perhaps very briefly today, or, or maybe not. Carrie's one of our uh, most favorite professors teaching our marketing course, and she'll be moderating. Um, also worth mentioning um, about Presidio is that we have a fantastic hybrid model that brings people together to build community, but also allows virtual flexibility. Um, so we think that's important for adult learners. Some days you just can't make it to class outside of your house. Uh, maybe you have responsibilities at home or, or things that come up with work. And so we do offer that flexibility where you can attend in person or online. Um, that said, we're really excited right now because next year we are moving to a beautiful campus in the North Bay here in the Bay Area after we merge with the University of Redlands this summer, um, which hopefully you write about on our website. Um, and that will be a really wonderful opportunity for those of you who are interested in building community through events and uh, community living and uh, finding opportunities to be in nature and more. So um, we can share more about that um, if you have questions with Nellie. Um, and finally, most importantly, in many ways, our community is so incredibly passionate and inspiring. Um, you are going to meet at Presidio some of your best friends. You're going to meet your future business partners and collaborators. Um, and I hope that you will just get a glimpse of that tonight about the kind of amazing individuals in the Presidio community. Um, so with that, I would like to pass it along to Carrie maltzby loop um, I have to say this is incredibly exciting that Carrie is here with us because it's her birthday. So please uh, join me in wishing her happy birthday. Um, Carrie, as I mentioned, is one of our faculty members at Presidio. She's been here teaching marketing for over three years and she brings incredible knowledge from experience in the field as well as in the classroom uh, to nurture the next generation of marketing leaders and entrepreneurs. Um, Carrie's also a very effective and impactful marketing consultant with a ton of projects, including topics that cover fair trade and entrepreneurship and wildfire insurance and girls empowerment and more. So we're so grateful to have Carrie here to moderate and happy birthday. And now passing it to you. Thank you so much, Liz. And welcome, everyone. Uh, I love this community so much, which is why I'm here on my birthday. Um, and it's just an honor to be with all of you amazing dynamic women and all the people in the audience. Uh, so we are here today to celebrate International Women's Day and to highlight the vital role that women play in advancing sustainability and social justice. Before we begin, I wanted to highlight the importance of taking an intersectional and inclusive approach to anti-patriarchy initiatives like International Women's Day. It's important to recognize that not all women experience the same issues and challenges um, in the same way. Individuals' experiences and identities are shaped by a range of you know, factors uh, such as race, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and ability. It's important to uplift the perspectives and experiences of all women, trans women, black women, brown women, indigenous women, gay women, disabled women, immigrant women, low income women, and all identities that have been historically erased, oppressed, and marginalized. In this fight for women equality, it's also critical to ensure the safety and equality of others oppressed by the patriarchy, including non-binary, intersex, and transgender people. At its core, International Women's Day is about working together to dismantle all systems of oppression. The theme for this International Women's Day is embrace equity. Overall, promoting gender equity and inclusion is not only a matter of social justice, but also a strategic approach to create a more sustainable and resilient future. Studies have shown that when women are empowered, communities and societies as a whole benefit from this. For example, studies have shown that when women are involved in the planning and implementation of development projects, they tend to prioritize community needs and have a better understanding of local ecological systems, leading to more sustainable and equitable outcomes. Women have, having greater economic power is associated with better health outcomes, improved education, and stronger communities. 
women are often disproportionately affected by environmental degradation and climate change, and their participation in decision-making on these issues can lead to more effective and sustainable solutions. Additionally, studies have shown that when women are involved in resource management, there is less overuse and degradation of resources and fewer conflicts over resources. And lastly, gender diversity leads to more creative and robust decision-making processes. So it can help to identify the best solutions for problems and challenges. There are so many reasons why women's empowerment and why women's contributions are important. Today's panel is about celebrating women's important and necessary contributions to sustainability and social justice. And it's also about providing an honest and brave dialogue about the ongoing challenges that women continue to face in these fields and around the globe and shining a light on how we can increase gender equity and inclusion to bring a world where people and planet can thrive for generations to come. We will start with a panel discussion and then we will open it up to Q&A. And at the end, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. We are just honored to be joined today by three incredibly talented women and Presidio Graduate School alumni who are forging the way to a more sustainable and equitable future. I'd like to welcome Hillary, Abel, Elena Omadeo, and Carol Shu. We have so much ground to cover tonight. So I just wanted to start off the conversation um, with having you amazing women introduce yourself and tell us your year at PGS. That's um, always very important. Um, and you know, talk about your organization and just also say a few words about a woman that has inspired you along your professional path. Um, let's start with you, Carol. Hi, everyone. Um, I am so sorry, first of all, that I'm in the car right now. <laughs> I'm on a work trip doing a film project and our timing uh, didn't work out as I had expected. Um, I am C22. I finished my program in 2018, um, did the part-time MBA program and got to overlap with Elena, which was really, really fun. And um, a woman that uh, has inspired me, but also really mentored me would be um, one of my professors, Anne Savageo. She's an amazing environmental artist, and I studied design with an emphasis in sustainability. And she taught me a lot about um, speaking up for myself and being more bold, and especially in um, sustainability where science is still pretty male dominated. Um, and I was coming out from a design perspective. Sometimes you didn't get a lot of um, credibility from the traditional science folks <laughs> studying sustainability. So she is my uh, inspiration and mentor. Thank you. How about um, we move to you, Elena? Hi, everybody. Elena Olmedo here. Um, I am I was a cohort C25 uh, back in starting in 2016, which seems like a world ago, but um, it actually it actually wasn't. Um, I'm I'm now with Natural Resources Defense Council. I focus on building decarbonization and building electrification. And a woman that inspires me is Michelle Obama. Um, I know she inspires many women, um, and she doesn't know it, but she is my mentor. And I, I read all of her books, and she's like, uh, she has like the roadmap for how for self improvement and growth. And I just, I just love her and her messages. I love that. She, she's my mentor too. I'm gonna claim her as well. <laughs> her. She mentors a lot of women. <laughs> yeah, she does. Um, thank you, Elena and Hillary. Hi, everybody. I just want to know how Michelle Obama finds the time, right, <laughs> to mentor so many people. She's amazing. Um, I'm also really happy to be here tonight. It's always wonderful to connect with the Presidio community. Uh, my name is Hillary Abel, and I was a part-time MBA student uh, from 2013 to 2017. I believe it was C18. Um, and I actually have the honor now of teaching a, a two-credit course at Presidio called Cooperatives, Employee Ownership, and Workplace Democracy, which is essentially what I've, what I've sent, spent my career on. Um, 
And I'm currently uh, working at an organization I co-founded uh, nine years ago now and worked on a lot as I was while I was getting my MBA uh, called Project Equity. And we work on expanding employee ownership for low wage workers across the country. And I'm focused on, on policy and impact measurement these days. Uh, the woman who came to mind for me when you asked the question, Carrie, is a woman named Nidia Diaz, who was a... Um, part of the resistance to the dictatorship in El Salvador in the 1980s. And um, through a series of flukes, um, invited me to witness the signing of the peace accords in 1991. And um, she taught me many things. She taught me, uh, well, I could never claim to have the fortitude that she had. She was imprisoned and wrote an incredible book called I Was Never Alone and went on to be a human rights commissioner and a, a politician in El Salvador. Um, but she also taught me the what it means to invest in a young person or just to believe in a young person. So I was like 22 years old or something. There was, I had no business being at those peace accords, <laughs> but um, she, she invited me. And I, I've always thought back on that experience um, as an honor I hadn't earned, but that I had anyway. And that's kind of inspired me to keep going and doing social justice work. Oh, thank you all for sharing. That's powerful. And um, just, you know, the different types of you know, inspiration and mentors that we have, some that are celebrities that we don't know, but who can inspire so many of us and um, other people that, you know, have this, you know, resilience and this, this bravery that we can try to model. So thank you for that. Um, so my first question is to all the panelists uh, and, you know, maybe we will start with um, Elena again, if you don't mind me <laughs> going to you, um, but, you know, research has, been showing that that women are leading the change, um, the charge really in advancing environmental and social justice across the globe. Uh, so for instance, studies have found that national parliaments with more women pass more stringent climate policies and women's participation in politics generates more effective and equitable climate outcomes. Um, in the corporate world, it's been shown that companies adopt more socially and ecologically sustainable practices when their boards include women. Um, you know, as powerful women leaders, could each of you speak to your contributions to sustainability and social justice and how Presidio and your experience there, you know, prepared you to make this type of impact? Thanks for starting off with that question. And I just want to start by saying, yeah, I, I don't think it's a, a mistake that, you know, women are having significant contributions in this space because it's what we care about. We, we prioritize people and we prioritize the environment and um, and and I think that you know our, our our values speak to that in so many ways. Um, in terms of my contributions to sustainability and social justice, um, I've worked a lot on greenhouse gas emission reductions, and I, I started off in really helping cities reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, quantifying their emissions, creating climate action plans to help them get there. Um, and now I focus uh, primarily on building electrification, so a very sector-specific topic to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And um, part of my work, uh, my, my claim to fame was really in, in the city of San Jose uh, doing um, natural gas bans and building electrification for new construction. Um, when San Jose was actually the largest city to pass a natural gas ban for new construction um, in the United States. And following San Jose's leadership, many, many other cities across the, the country um, passed policies, building policies that encouraged electrification of buildings in new construction. I think there's over 100 cities that now have now passed, um, have passed policies that are, are really ambitious and are going to make a significant impact in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions. I am now focused um, a lot more on equitable building decarbonization policies because that's really critical to our work. We need to lead with equity and understand how our policies impact communities and uh, impact underserved communities, impact folks that are most impacted by the effects of climate change. And so um, now my focus area is really more on helping to serve the needs of underserved communities. Um, so I focus thing, on things like energy burden, energy justice, housing affordability, um, and, and how we align those things with building decarbonization and our goals there. Um, Presidio helped me in a number of ways. I would say the first is 
problem solving skills. <laughs> we, we try to solve a lot for a lot of problems at Presidio and luckily I got a, a breadth of different experiences, just the broad array of different experiences. I, I feel like the experimental learning projects really helped um, me because I got to work on a small team and the small team kind of became this intimate group that we worked with to try to tackle a problem that the consultant brought to the table. Um, so I uh, recall one of my experimental learning projects was working for a beverage company that was looking to, to, to grow and we helped them to forecast sales. We looked at their inventory. Uh, we tried to project future sales. And um, that was, it was, it was interesting to have that background to try to bring our problem solving skills to the table. I would say another thing that Presidio really taught me, which was really key and has really helped me in my work now, is just the importance of emotional intelligence. We had a whole class dedicated to emotional intelligence. It was my favorite class at Presidio, even though I didn't, I did, it wasn't the best grade, but it was my favorite class at Presidio because I just learned the importance of really focusing on emotional intelligence to work on teams and to really get work done, uh, you really got to start with psychological safety and making sure that it's it's an inclusive environment, understanding where people are coming from to have conversations around what the shared goals are, what the shared um, mission is. And so, um, you know, I was I was inspired by that class. I continued my my research um, from the readings of that class, and it's helped me talk and have many different conversations in, in my career and help it's it's helped me get things done. Um, and I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there um, in terms of, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. That's great. Thank you so much, Elena. There was so much covered. I really lo love that you brought up the experiential learning and the, the power of, you know, applied projects when you're doing real world work and you get to exercise that emotional intelligence while learning about consulting. And it's even fun, um, you know, seeing for me as faculty, some of the, the students that were working together on experiential projects in the class go on to start their own consulting firm, like Haifa Collective, which is like a nice um, Presidio led consulting firm that, you know, stemmed, I think, because of their exposure to a lot of this experiential learning. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, the same question, hopefully I'll remember it. It's kind of long, <laughs> goes to you. Uh, uh, maybe Carol, if you want to take a stab, that'd be great. You still, I think Carol might be frozen. So maybe H Hillary. <laughs> sure, sure. I'm happy to pick it up. Um, so I think the question is about my, my, our contributions to social justice and sustainability. Um, so I happened into being passionate and working with business as a tool for social change by, uh, by luck, by happenstance, I was a sort of human rights organizer, if you will, um, and a teacher when I was just out of college. I um, really wanted to change the world, but really didn't think of business as the way to do it. It was the last thing I wanted to do. <laughs> but I did end up working for um, a worker cooperative called Equal Exchange that was a very early leader in the fair trade movement. And that really opened my eyes to the fact that if if we try to change the world only through things outside of the business world, you know, social work, community organizing, government, whatever it may be, we're missing the power that business has over our economy and, and it can also be a, a tool for good. So, so I got that through that experience and um, uh, worked in various nonprofits and international development and, and fair trade actually. Um, but since 2003, I've been working on um, worker cooperative development and fostering employee ownership among low-wage workers. And, and eight years of that work before I got me at my MBA was with um, some of the folks, some of the workers in this country with the most barriers to economic uh, resiliency and, and stability, um, immigrant women workers from Mexico and Central America. And um, I came in as sort of a third generation of leadership in a very small nonprofit that had developed a pretty innovative model that was having real impact in these women's lives and in their families' lives. And I was able, with the small team we had, to take that to the next level where we could 
we learned how to do cooperative development and the creation of startup businesses that were great businesses that were owned by the workers and delivered. They were also sustainable. They were some of the first green cleaning companies in the 1990s before anyone thought about cleaning with non-toxic products, right? Um, and so I, I was part of a team that was able to create a model that um, has inspired and informed um, the creation of immigrant cooperatives all around the country. And there's many, many more of them. I recently have worked with one for community outreach workers, Promotoras in San Francisco. Um, and we had measurable impact in, um, in the families' lives. Uh, their, the women's individual incomes were doubling and tripling through having full-time work, through having agency in the workplace and being able, therefore, to... Um, have benefits like health insurance that they never had before and to have a voice in their workplace, to be decision makers in their workplace. And that, of course, overflowed into their family lives and their communities. Um, but we also measured the impact on family income. And what we found was that most of the women in these cooperatives were becoming the primary breadwinner in their families uh, because if they had had partners or husbands or you know other people in their family working, they were often in very low wage jobs with no agency and, and without any equity that they were able to um, acquire. So the first year we measured it, their family incomes were increasing by 40%. And the last year we measured it about eight years later, family incomes were increasing by 80%. So that was something that our whole team was really proud of. And it inspired me to want to take that kind of work to a much larger scale. And the reason I went to Presidio was really that I had encountered some folks who felt like the kinds of partners I really wanted to work with to be able to start to scale that type of you know, positive social and environmental impact for low wage workers. And a lot of those people had MBAs. <laughs> and I said, hmm, I've, I'm, I'm working in business. I'm helping people start businesses now, but I don't have any business training, a little bit of lived experience. Um, and my co-founder at Project Equity, Allison Lingain, um, has an MBA. And that was part of what drew me to want to, um, to work with her. I just like the way that those folks thought, and these were kind of mission-driven MBAs, and of course, Presidio was the best place to do that. Um, so my experience at Presidio, you know, I think a couple of things it gave me. One was fluency in certain business terms that I just wouldn't have gotten otherwise. I'd been in the workforce, I don't know, 20 years by the time I went back to get my degree, and um, I love to read up and, you know, try to find time for, you know, professional development outside of just doing the work, which I think is the best form of professional development. But I also think there are things that you can do in an academic program that you can't do otherwise. So I learned about capital markets. I learned what a market failure is. And so my work in cooperatives, I learned that often what cooperatives have done and what government has used cooperatives to do is to address market failures. Um, so that was like a, a new framing that I got for work I was already involved in. Um, and then also specific tools, you know, whether through EL projects where I was able to kind of get some benefit for, you know, Project Equity's early thinking as we were starting the organization. Um, and I remember in my econ class that we, I can't remember what the the um, name of the activity was or the type of financial analysis, but we developed a financial tool that looked at kind of past and future revenue and and um earnings of a business in a pretty sophisticated way. And I basically adapted that and it became our organization's first model for feasibility studies to help businesses determine whether they would be successful in transitioning to employee ownership. So that was like one of many super practical ways, but more than anything else, it was really the confidence to feel like I had fluency in, in business concepts and could talk to business owners about their businesses and could talk to people in the business ecosystem about employee ownership and cooperatives, which is what I wanted to do. Amazing story. Cooperatives are so important um, to as we think about, you know, more kind of reading capitalism and models that work for more people um, and equity. And uh, I love that your story is similar to mine and that I'd also started a business and, you know, having studied anthropology needed more business understanding in order to do what I wanted to with it. So I think that that's such a great way to come at business school is, you know, starting something and saying, hey, I want to do more than I've currently can or, or move quicker. And it's also great to see students and at a PGS that are actually working on their business and utilizing their business for classes and, you know, you know, having students support them on experiential learning while they work on their business. So that's also a really great thing. Um, and Carol, I think you're live with us now. Uh, would love to ask you the same question about your contributions um, regarding sustainability and social justice and how Presidio prepared you. Yeah, I, um, so my work at the North Face is more focused on um, 
a lot of it is focused on the products that we make and lowering the environmental impacts of those products. And so I get to spend a lot of time working with amazing suppliers, with different types of partners, um, building partnerships. And I look at my work more in terms of um, helping a big brand like the North Face make an impact on an individual farmer and, and helping them Farmers, especially who um, are doing amazing work, like regenerate, implementing regenerative practices, for instance, um, helping to make sure that they can financially stay stewards of their land because they know it best and they know how to take care of it. Um, we work with farmers across the world um, who can supply different types of raw materials for our products. And that's one of my favorite parts of the job is meeting them um, and getting to connect with them and support them. Um, what I learned from Presidio that's really helped me is I would totally second Hillary in, in just learning the lingo and the language of business and being able to speak uh, speak with the words that business people use um, in meetings at my brand and being able to make the business case for why we should be doing that we're doing um, that has been really powerful. When I was at Presidio, the two classes that I remember the most are my um, community, the classes where we learned a lot about communication and how to um, speak to different audiences and how to meet people where they are. Um, I remember doing walk and talks <laughs> every class, and that was so much fun because we practice active listening and a huge part of my role as a brand is being an influencer and listening to people's concerns and helping bring them along the journey so that we can implement some really awesome projects. I really appreciate those all that time that you have been teaching us how to communicate, how to listen to each other and how to use the business language to um, implement the I love that, um, Carol, and we still do the walk and talks. So those have uh, lived on and it's great to hear that they were impactful for you. Um, so I'm gonna pop back to, to you, Hillary. Uh, the theme for 2023's International Women's Day is embrace equity. So as a co-founder of Project Equity, what does that phrase mean to you? Why is it important? And what have you learned from doing this type of work? Yeah, um, I love this question. And um, we debated early on in Project Equity's life whether to keep the name. It was something my co-founder had come up with for sort of a different purpose. And we thought, okay, let's do this. And I'm so glad we decided to keep it. Um, the reason it resonated kind of initially for me was, was twofold. Uh, the word has many meanings to me. And as I mentioned, I've worked with um, worker-owned businesses for many years now. And so the owning equity in a business and for people who are house cleaners or bakers or any other kind of frontline or, or lower middle wage job, manufacturing workers, to be able to hold equity in their company is so revolutionary in some ways and yet so easy to do. And there's a you know interesting debate in the employee ownership world about like, is it making capitalism better? Is it anti-capitalist? And you know, I don't really care actually, because I just know it makes workers' lives better. <laughs> so Love for it. me, the word equity as a way um, to not only create quality jobs for workers, but also to create equity and asset building. So we all know the difference between income and assets. And if you don't have asset building or equity, um, there's a lot of limitations to, to one's ability to achieve financial security. So, so financial equity was there, uh, which relates to our work. And then sort of the old forever meaning of the word equity, if you look in the dictionary, still most dictionaries these days would say um, sort of fairness and impartiality. And you know that was always like, the, our economy is not fair. <laughs> and so wanting to make the economy more fair. Um, and to be honest, I'm probably older than most people on this call, even on the panel. And um, I believe that the word equity started to be used for racial and social justice, um, you know, relatively recently, maybe in the last 10 years, maybe 15. Um, but it, as that meaning of it became very clear and much more used, um, it completely fit with our original vision for Project Equity and was part of the reason we chose to keep the name. Um, 
So I think we all know that that image, that that visual of, you know, people standing side by side who are different heights and trying to see over a fence to some game or something like that, trying to participate in something. Um, and the notion of equality is like everybody, everybody stands on the same level. It's a level playing field. But we know that the notion of equity is we're meeting people where they're at. And so that the parallel image is people of different heights, you know, having something to stand on so they can be at the same level and see over the fence into whatever the activity is they're participating in. Um, so, so equity means to me addressing um, historical and racial and gender and other, so many other barriers that, that many of us face um, and meeting people where they're at and helping folks succeed through, through true opportunity, not just a generic opportunity, which most people with barriers, we can't expect folks to be able to access true opportunity if they're starting with so many, many barriers in the first place. So um, those are some of the meanings that I have for the word equity and uh, love the theme. So thanks for the question. Well, and thanks for that wonderful articulation of the visual that we've seen that really <laughs> came to life, so powerful. Um, so we're gonna go back to you, Carol, while, while we still have you live, um, before you go, <laughs> go into a little um, issue spot. Uh, Green Briz, a Green Briz report found that women went from holding 28% of CSO positions in 2011 to 54% in 2021. That's a 94% increase. However, outside of sustainability, women in business have not advanced as quickly as men um, in traditional C-suite roles. And so men far outnumber you know, us. And so according to a Morningstar report, looking at data from 2019, women hold only 12% of CEO level roles um, and percentages upward of like 2.8% since 2015. Again, very small increases that we've had there. So I'm wondering, you know, as a corporate sustainability manager, um, why do you think women are advancing in leadership roles and sustainability more quickly than other roles? And what can be learned from this to advance gender parity and other leadership positions? Yeah, I, I think that one of the strongest things that I've gotten to experience during my time working in sustainability and apparel is just the community. And I think that the community of women in sustainability and apparel is also very strong, even as like a smaller cut down of just the general sustainable apparel community. And I feel like that's been a really great benefit to women who, who work in the field because we know each other, we bounce ideas off each other, even if we work for competitive competitor companies. Um, in sustainability, there isn't that same level of competitiveness and we work together and ask each other questions. And I, I feel like that community has really helped us. Um, I think if we can have that same level of openness and sharing and support, it, it will definitely help just want more women advance and, and find those opportunities that are really hard. That I think is probably the strongest thing that I've experienced in my time um, in this industry. Yeah, that, that's very inspiring to know that you all are really working together and it's more cooperation and collaboration than competition. So thank you for that. Um, and Elena, at uh, NRDC, where you work, 56% of employees and 54% of executives are women. Remarkable. Uh, could you speak to how the NRDC has influenced these major strides in gender equity and how this diversity influences the efficiency and outcomes of the work that you're doing? Yeah, um, I think NRDC, I mean, there's probably multiple ways to answer this, but I think NRDC really promotes a culture of um, of elevating women and 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 promoting women and supporting women. Um, NRDC is a is an organization that has about seven hundred plus employees, and we have a uh, women's caucus, an affinity group for uh, women and folks that identify uh, with women um, that has over three hundred members. So uh, it's um, you know, almost half of NRDC is is um, a member of this affinity group, uh, an employee resource group. 
and um, the women's caucus they they held they hold events they they have promotional opportunities they have professional development opportunities um, they they have networking events they have I mean it's it's really a culture that supports the growth of women and I think that um, that women before me have really fought. To, to, to create this type of culture at NRDC. I think that it wasn't always this way, but there have been women that have been advocating for women and have been collaborating with women to have our space at NRDC. And that's really helped push the organization um, to have representation and to have women in leadership positions. Um, our previous president uh, was Gina McCarthy, who uh, served on, was the administrator for the EPA. Um, and uh, was also an advisor on the Obama administration. So she led our organization for a period of time, probably about two years ago, um, and, and is really a, 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 a leader and a mover and a shaker in the in in the sustainability space. Um, and then, I mean, the program that I, I think back to the program, one of the programs that I worked with called the American Cities Climate Challenge, which was a, a program that brought a lot of resources and technical support to 25 cities across the US that were focused on achieving really ambitious climate strategies on buildings and transportation. And when I think about that program, um, it it was led by women and there was women in many different leadership uh, positions and capacities. And um, it, it just, it was very women dominate, dominant and um, it was, it speaks to you know the, the I think the culture at an REC that that really um, that really elevates women. Thank you, women leading women and advocating. That's that's powerful. Um, so we only have a few more minutes before, until we open it up to the audience. But I think this quick question is so important. Um, would love to hear you all speak to some of the gender specific challenges, stereotypes, barriers you've had to overcome at different points in your career. How do you overcome them? What advice might you give um, to other women experiencing them? And I'll just kind of let you hop in, whoever. I'll jump in. Um, I love this question and I love the opportunity to reflect on it. Um, I've, I've been in leadership roles in nonprofits, you know, two small nonprofits, um, one that I co-founded and one that I, again, took over as like a third generation of leadership for um, for about 20 years. And there are a lot of women leaders in nonprofits. So I think that's been a good space for me to be able to kind of step into leadership roles. Um, and, you know, I have had a lot of privilege in my life. Obviously, I'm, I'm white and come from an upper middle class family. And I remember once my father saying, you know, you could be president someday, which I don't think I ever could be, but hearing him say that as a child was a real, a real beautiful thing. And I think I had some sense that I could, could do some things, um, which women don't always have. But at the same time, I think I had some, some barriers that were internal around, around confidence, to be honest, you know, confidence is still is an issue for me. It's something I still struggle with today. Um, and so I think one thing that we can, can do is recognize that, um, many women lead quite differently from men and, um, you know, the humanity, the communication that we prioritize, employee and partner engagement, you know, things that are, you know, fairly stereotypically women's things, I think are um, really positive for organizations and businesses, you know, employee engagement, you know, humane culture, um, all the things that we learn at Presidio really make better organizations. Um, but still, I think one of the challenges for me is I, I haven't always found that I could make myself truly heard because my voice can be softer, a little bit more indirect or um, a little bit more inclusive and not, not commanding, not top down. And while I believe in that kind of leadership, I have found that I don't always um, succeed in, in getting my point across or having the impact I want to have because of how we tend to know how to listen to more dominant or more male forms of leadership. Um, and things that have helped, you know, um, mentoring, um, coaching, I've really found like individual management coaching or, or life coaching to be incredibly valuable. Um, and just a circle of women um, supporters. So friends, um, colleagues, as um, Carol spoke to, I think is is invaluable as a woman leader. Thank you for that. I have so many thoughts, but I'm going to keep it going because um, that was just wonderful nuggets. Uh, Elena or Carol, would you like to weigh in? 
Yeah, I can um, jump in here. Um, first of all, I, I want to just um, mention that I think I've definitely experienced challenges in the work in the workspace um, around gender equity. Um, but I think being a woman of color is an additional challenge that I think many women of color face if, if we have like an invisible wall to climb over for this gender equity issue. Um, women of color have like an additional wall before they even get to the second wall. And um, and that has shown up. That's that's an additional challenge that I still deal with in, in different workspaces. Um, in terms of like gender equity, I've been in um, a lot of male dominant spaces because I work on building electrification and there's a lot of engineers in this space. And I started in energy efficiency and there was a lot of engineers in that space. And um, I start when I first started, I, I really tried to ask a lot of questions around energy efficiency and like kind of trying to understand like concepts and working with engineers, they don't really have the best explanation of things. So trying to like really grasp like the big picture and being able to communicate that to other people um, in the layman's terms is like really, really important and something that I feel like I can do. I can do well, um, but I had to like put myself in uncomfortable spaces and really feel like I didn't know much and have I had to ask the dumb dumb questions first and try to understand so that now like even if I if I don't you know get it exactly I know that I have good background I know that these these concepts are things that can be communicated to a wider audience and there is benefit in that and strength in being able to do that. And so just being really curious and being able to put yourself out there, I think is really important to, to try to understand um, different spaces um, where women might not dominate. Thank you for that. I'd so agree. So agree. And and I'll, I'll just add that um, what Elena said about being a woman of color is, is like an extra challenge. And I second what Hillary said about coaching. Um, it's so helpful and powerful and I was lucky enough to be able to get some support with a Jedi coach um, last year. And he just made me mindful of things that I was not even aware of. And once you're mindful of them, you can think about the when you're in that situation, you can start to target it and think, okay, this is what I'm going to do differently next time. Or this is how I can reframe the conversation or, or talk to this person who just sometimes doesn't under, also doesn't know or isn't aware of, of what they're saying and how they're saying it. Um, so it's like just building awareness. Um, I actually, my boss, when I first started at the North Face was also a Presidio grad. And I work in the outdoor industry. Um, it's very male dominated. Um, I would be in meetings where people would, I would too nervous to say something when I first started and people would be having these higher level conversations and my boss always brought me into all meetings regardless of who was who else was in that room and I I actually think he was so mindful of that and he probably got that through his classes at Presidio as well he always thought to ask me how I thought or how I felt or if I had anything to add to the conversation and I try to be mindful of doing that same thing because of, because he did that for me. That was a powerful example, Carol, um, and the importance of allyship, right? And having, and I do think that we we do a good job of talking about that at Presidio. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, you know, again, such great nuggets and insights that you all have have shared with us. I want to open it up to uh, the participants and the audience. Please um, put any questions that you might have. Um, in the chat, and I'm going to start going over some audience questions that came in. One um, is love that we're lauding all of the wonderful cooperative women leaders here. What about the phenomenon of women who compete with each other? Every woman for herself types. The floor is yours, <laughs> whoever. <laughs> Has, has dealt with uh, that type before, or has not? I, I guess I'll say um, on one level that 
that kind of mentality is not going to get a person very far, I would say. Um, I'm on a big group chat with these other women and one man who work in sustainability in the apparel industry. And the rapport between us is so supportive. And someone asked a question about something like, have you experienced this? And we all jump in and help. And I think that ultra competitive mindset just, I don't think someone could advance very far in, in the sustainability field with that mindset. Um, maybe they could for a while, but just the culture, and we want to build that as a culture of being supportive and um, collaborative. I think that culture doesn't really allow for that type of mentality. I agree. It's not going to work. Any thoughts from Carol or Hillary? I'll just say that I think it sometimes can work in the short term, but I totally agree that it doesn't work in the in the long term. And I forget what that exact saying is. I believe it's an African proverb and it's often used in co-op circles. If you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. So I think just, just keeping that in mind and not getting thrown off by competition or um, that kind of thing. Yeah. I love right. that. Proverb. I actually just used it in a slide deck yesterday. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, Elena, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, I think we've all probably come across women who are like that. And um, maybe it's like circumstances where they've had to become like that because they've been the only woman in a room and you got to, you know, fight to, to create space for yourself. Um, but I, I think for me, one thing that I try to do is to try to find some common ground with with those women where I feel like there there could be some tension or there is like kind of you know every woman for herself mentality um, because we all have some co common ground as women and there's something that we can relate on and I think that that you know being able to connect and like find humanity or find that we're both human like we have similar struggles possibly um can you know kind of chip away at that person and like bring them back down to the collective collective uh group Agreed. Um, another question came in. I think it's a really important one. How do you deal with imposter syndrome in your new role um, at a full-time position? I'll, I'll answer that because I feel like that person might have known about me. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I mean, I, I dealt with that a lot when I first started in an RDC. I I I think that um, I I would go home. There was days where I'm just like, I'm gonna get fired tomorrow. I know it. Like I I, I don't know anything. I you know. Um, and I had to kind of take a step back and under realize that like, you know, a lot of people feel that way. That there's so many people that I've talked to that feel that way that have imposter syndrome, and you might think that they're the most competent person on on your team, but they they might feel like an imposter. Um, so for me, um, for me, it's important to reflect on all of my experiences and bring those to the table, and remind myself that I have a lot to offer, that I have a lot of experience, including my experience at Presidio. Um, including other job experiences that that make me qualified for the role I'm, I'm doing. And usually, you know, in a few months, it does get better and you feel and you feel better and you feel more comfortable in your in your own skin. Thank you for that authenticity and honest experience that we've all, I think a lot of us have felt before. Uh, when I first started at the North Base, I um, had to learn a lot of different teams and meet a lot of people because my job is basically working with like almost every team at the brand. And um, I definitely insulted someone on accident <laughs> by email pretty badly, unintentionally. Like I congratulated them on something that was not actually correct. And um, I think, and I was so nervous all the time just being around these people um, who had been in their roles for ages and um, were, were much more higher up in their careers than I was. And at some point, it's just too much energy to worry about that stuff. And you just have to say, look, everyone was in my place at some point in their career. So 
if they have empathy and understand, then I'm totally okay. And <laughs> if they don't have the empathy to understand, then, you know, I, I can't do anything about that. Um, so I think it's remembering that everyone else was in your um, same same spot at some point in their career. Love it. Hilary, you want to close this out? Oh, I, I just love that someone named imposter syndrome. It's it's a thing. It's a real thing for many of us. And I think especially women. Um, and um, yeah, just I agree with Carol. Have have compassion for it and don't take it as fact. Don't take it as reality. Just say, okay, I'm feeling that and know that you're not alone. Love it. And you know, just what Elena was mentioning earlier just reminded me of how <clears throat> oftentimes women only apply to jobs when they like meet all of the criteria, um, like hundred percent of it. And then some, whereas men will like apply when they're like, you know, 10% of it and just, you know, the, that, those different levels of confidence. Um, and so, uh, another question came in and, um, you know, uh, I think it, admissions would be great to answer part of it, but I also think that, um, you all can weigh in as well. Um, and the question is, is Presidio right for someone who is not sure of what industry they want to work in after? So maybe, um, not sure if you all have your own personal experience, if you felt like you knew exactly what industry you wanted to work in before you went to Presidio, but would love to get your thoughts around if you feel like, um, you know, Presidio is good for people that aren't sure what they want to do. Do anyone have any thoughts on? <laughs> I'll, I'll weigh in. Um, I think Presidio is actually right for, for people who are unsure of what industry they want to work in because there are there is so much exposure that you will get from going to Presidio. You, I feel like we covered the gamut in terms of all of the different sustainability topics. Like I worked on um, sustainable agriculture projects, sustainable fashion. Um, I feel like you really get an opportunity to work in the spaces that you are interested in. And, and then you end up working in other spaces that you don't even know you're interested in, but you develop an interest. And so you get some background and information there too, and some credibility in that to be able to speak in that space. So um, for me, you know, I, I came in um, with some experience on, on the greenhouse gas emission side, but I had no idea I was gonna end up working in, in the building sector. Thanks. And I'll, I'll just also kind of weigh in um, that I went into, you know, I got my MBA thinking I, you know, wanted to start my own business because I was running a business horribly and wound up falling in love with marketing and then wound up working at a startup with in marketing. So I, I kind of echo Elena, your response, you know, the B school is such a great opportunity. It exposes, exposes you to so many different business functions as well as different industries, especially with experiential learning projects. You have the opportunity to choose different projects that you want to work on, and then you can choose different industries that you want, you might want to explore. So absolutely, it's the best. It's one of the top reasons why I think people go to get their MBAs to explore. Um, and as far as the question around job placement, um, whoever and you know asks that, I, I don't have that off top, but I definitely think that's a wonderful admissions question that someone can um, respond to you as far as our job placement rate. Um, and I know we have uh, only have one minute out. Um, I just want to thank the panelists. Uh, this was a lovely discussion. It was so, it's just an honor to be with you on my birthday and on International Women's Day and to just hear about your journey. Um, you all are doing such important work from large company, North Face, you know, that has the ability to make a lot of impact with just small changes that they can do to Hillary, what you're doing as a leaders in equity. You've been talking about this with cooperatives for so long and this model is so important. And then Elena, what you're doing is really, you know, pushing the needle forward um, on the issues that we're having in regards to social justice and sustainability. So thank you all. And um, I'm not sure if uh, Liz or anyone else is gonna pop out, but um, happy to sign us off. Uh, there you are, Nelly. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. Do you, do you have a few more words that you wanted to say? 
Yes, just again, echoing thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to Carrie for joining us on your birthday. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and to our attendees for joining. Um, I do want to um, just quickly do a shout out that in, on April 20th, we will be also having another alumni impact panel um, on Earth Day. So stay tuned on our events calendar. We'll share more information about that, but we hope that you all can join us then as well. So I hope you all have a great rest of your evening and thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Happy Women's Day.